one, two, three, four, five. Okay, we're going to get going in just a few minutes here, but before we do, we have to thank our partners who are streaming the show live along with us, TheVirtualDriver.com, WheelspinTV, and RumbleStrip.net. Also have to thank our friends in the chat room who are helping to moderate that, DC Auto Geek, and Mud Monster. And we'll get going here just any minute now. Live from the Frankfurt Auto Show, this is AutoLine Live. We're going to be showing you all kinds of things that are going on at this show in just a minute. But first, we have to thank our sponsor for this show, Audi. And you can check it all out at AudiUSA.com. Lots of good information there. But as I was saying, there's so many things to show you at the show. We're only going to be able to give you a little bit of taste because there's just too much. But let's start with one of the hottest things that are going on here, the new Porsche 911. You know, even though Porsche had its press conference hours ago, this stand is still jam-packed because this is one of the hottest cars that are shown here. Norm, let's elbow our way in and give everybody a look at what this car is like. And of course, they've got this blue Carrera S, and we've got to pull people away from it. And that's how you have to do it at the auto show. When you're working here as working media, everybody recognizes that we're all trying to get a shot of this sh this car. and. That's a little bit of what we can show you for now, but come on, let's walk on through the rest of what's going on in this stand. Hey, John, we'll run into all kinds of people on the, on the show floor here, too. We've got some folks that we've scheduled to interview, and then we'll just run into some others. But right now, we've got to show you what I think is one of the coolest cars that is at this show. This, folks, is actually probably the first hybrid that was ever developed. This is a lure Porsche that was probably done circa, I'm gonna say 1901 to 1903. And Norm, get a shot of the front wheels there because what you're looking at is an electric motor built into the hub. In fact, if you come around on this side of it, you can see all the electrical windings that were the, for the motor. So this is really like a Chevrolet Volt. It's an extended range electric vehicle. Let's go back along the side of it, Norm, because I want to show everybody the motor that's on this thing. It's beautiful. And what they did is they, they had this engine running a generator built into the floor of this car, are batteries, and they run the hub motors that are in the front wheels that you just saw. Just an amazing piece of technology, and it's so cool to see that Porsche has fully restored this thing. Okay, let's keep on moving, because there's so much that we've got to try and take a look at in this show. Come on this way. You know what? I know anybody walking, watching back in the States uh, realizes that we've been here for hours on the floor. There's all kinds of press conferences that have been going on. They've pretty much wrapped up, at least for the main automakers, they're wrapped up. There's some smaller companies that are having their press conferences right now, but doesn't look like much of the media is there. They're all looking at the cars that were introduced earlier today, and in fact, here's one of them right now, this Bugatti Grand Sport Roadster. No top to that car. You know, the Veyron is amazing enough on its own, but now with this Roadster version, even more astonishing. Okay, that's enough eye candy. Let's keep moving here, Norm. And just elbow your, your way through. Everybody's trying to take a look at 
all the cars that are on display, and sometimes they get in your way, but most of the people here are more working media. So you know that you just got to get out of the way when somebody with a camera shows up. Oh, give them a quick shot. Here's another version of the Roadster with a, a wild paint job on it. Never seen quite anything like that. I like the pure solid color because to me the graphics take away from the overall beauty of the Veyron and uh, that's why I prefer the solid color that we were just looking at, the red one. Okay, let's keep on moving here because like I said, there's just so much to see. And Norm, let's keep on walking, but check out this convertible version of the Continental GTC. First time I've seen one with the top dropped. Another debut at the Frankfurt Show. Okay, let's keep on going. What you'll notice here we're going outside, is that there's just so much going on at this show. All the German automakers have their own buildings here. Here, They don't share it with nobody but themselves. That's true of Audi, it's true of Volkswagen, true of BMW. In fact, we're going to run into Johan Denison here, the, the head of Audi USA. We'll be talking about the display that they have because there's an amazing story in it. Watch it, Norm. They're going to back over you here. There's all kinds of cars running around the show here. Most of them are electrics or hydrogen-powered or hybrids. And as members of the media, you can just hop in one and have them show for you around. And sure beats walking in a lot of cases. And here's Johan right now. Be careful, don't get hit by the car here, but Hello, Johan, good seeing you. Terrific, likewise. Yeah, and uh, you could hold this microphone for yourself to, to talk. And uh, we'll talk about Audi's mm. cars in here in a minute, but mm. first I have to ask you about the Audi display because I've been to the Frankfurt mm -hmm. show before and this building wasn't here before. So tell me, what do right. you have here? It looks like you built something brand new just for the show. It is indeed. Uh, this is, you know, our home market, and uh, Audi is now the world's second largest luxury car manufacturer. So uh, I think we need to present our production lifestyle, and, and this is it. The planning for this uh, already commenced more than a year ago. The structure is uh, about 100 meters by, uh, by 70 meters. And uh, the total uh, space inside is just shy of 70,000 square feet. And uh, I think a great uh, environment in which to showcase uh, all the great new Audi products. Now, is this a permanent building? Will this be torn down afterwards, or what's the story on that? Amazing to people like you and I, but they will tear this down. Uh, it's going to stay up also for the, uh, the book fair, which follows the Frankfurt Auto Show. But at the end of October, it'll come down. And then what happens to it? It'll be disassembled, uh, and uh, what elements of it can be reused will be applied in other future Audi events. So when we come to the Frankfurt Show in another two years, something totally different will be here? You know, uh, it may well be something totally different. <laughs> That's amazing. And you've got a test track inside where people can get cars in and drive around inside the building. That's right. Uh, we wanted to give people an opportunity to experience our new products, also the new um, powertrain technologies that we have. So there's a, a 400 meter long test track uh, where they uh, can, uh, can gain some exposure to the new product. Well, you know, enough about buildings and test tracks. Let's go inside. I want to see some of the cars and you've got to tell me what you've got here and, and why you're doing them. Well, uh, of course, important for us in the U.S. is uh, we want to continue with the momentum that the brand has gained in, in uh, that market. You know, Audi is far more developed and entrenched as a high-end automaker uh, here in Europe and in Asia than is still the case in the U.S., even though we've made terrific progress. Um, sales volumes on their own are kind of encouraging for us. We broke through the 100,000-year mark last year for the first time. 
But uh, the big push for us now is uh, to create another center of gravity for the brand. We built a strong volume core around the A4 and the Q5 models. But uh, right here at the entrance is, um, of course, where we want to take the brand next. So we recently launched the new A8, followed by the all-new A7 and the all-new A6. These are the sports derivatives, so the S models of, uh, of those three car lines. The S8 uh, having its uh, global premiere here at the show today utilizes an all-new V8 bike turbo motor. By turbo, that means lots of power. And lots of torque. Uh, 520 horsepower. Uh, in a slightly different state of tune uh, in the S7 and the S6. Well, hold on. Let's get, let's get Norm to, to show the S7, or, or have you finished talking about no, the, I'm, the S8? I'm, I'm, I just wanted to refer that the motors okay. are essentially the same, different state of tune, 420 horsepower in both of those cases. But, of course, uh -huh. uh, being our flagship, it has uh, all the cross the lightweight uh, aluminium space frame body, uh, quattro all-wheel drive, and of course Audi's famous interiors with all the craftsmanship and uh, the, uh, the fine materials that uh, we've come to associate with the brand uh, over time. What do the sport models do for Audi? I mean, uh, clearly, you know, versus AMG or the M series or the V at Cadillac. It's, it, it gives an aura to the brand, but is it, is it really enough in sales for, for you to do things like this? Our S models are uh, becoming quite mainstream. For example, uh, the S4 in the, in the US already is accounting for almost 20% of the, of the total so model mix of the A4 a, range. So that's a very so high mix. A pretty hefty chunk. And uh, we expect, therefore, also uh, to, to see a significant share of the, the mix of the A6 and the A7 uh, coming from the S models. But you're right, they are there to, to add further emotional appeal to the range. But of course, the real powerhouse area uh, in terms of uh, sheer excitement comes from our RS models. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've just recently launched the DTRS. Mm -hmm. um, I'll show you what the car looks like in a moment as we make our way across. But uh, the, the next big news for us is the RS5. And uh, since we have Let's move that way, quite, right? Since it's close closer, by. We could maybe have a look at that. So uh, so how soon before all these, these new S models are on sale in the, the U.S. The market? The S models will reach the U.S. Uh, in time for the next model year. And uh, the RS5, which is the high-performance version in turn of the S5, so we have A5, S5, RS5. This represents the new uh, uh, mid-life cycle facelift for the car. And uh, we delayed the introduction of the RS5 to the U.S. so that we could do it with the new look. And when you say the next model year, that means? That means model year, uh, where are we now? Model year 13, which will probably see us introduce the cars around uh, July of next year. Okay, very good. Mm. What's next? So uh, I also want to use the opportunity to show you our A2 uh, um, concept car. Uh, this is illustrating uh, some of our technologies around uh, electromobility and uh, really probably comes uh, pretty close to capturing what will become uh, the ideal kind of urban commuting vehicle. It will be upscale, progressive, uh, luxurious, but relatively compact so as to maintain the light weight. You know, one of the big technological challenges for electrically driven uh, vehicles is driving range and weight is the enemy of, uh, of driving range. So we use all of Audi's uh, prowess in uh, lightweight body construction, um, the different materials to uh, reduce the weight of the car, but uh, present it in terms of the overall packaging uh, in such a way that it can comfortably still uh, accommodate four passengers. So this is the A2 concept. It's beautiful. It's it looks very high tech. It obviously looks like an electric and was designed to look that way. And that, you know, that is the idea to convey a little bit of, uh, of the technology that you can't see. Uh, but being concept cars, one can uh, also indulge somewhat uh -huh. and um, illustrate some things that, that may not make it eventually into, uh, into the production version. Now, I can see Audi doing something like this in an electric form in the U.S. market because everyone, I think, is going to have to have an electric. Would you also do a non-electric version of the A2 in the U.S.? The A2, uh, you know, is still a concept car, but uh, if we went down to 
a vehicle of this size in the U.S., we would probably do it as an electric vehicle only. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that the American consumer, in terms of their mindset and expectation that they have for a, what is still a high-end automobile, being an Audi, uh, would want a car that's a bit larger. And so the A3 will probably, for the foreseeable future, remain the entry model for the brand in the U.S. But because this would be electric, you would think then that people would accept it as an Audi in the U.S. market? I think people who would be looking at electric uh, cars, uh, they they do have different uh, uh, buying decision parameters, and uh, they would expect something more in line with this. And, uh, but of course, it doesn't end there. Uh, we could also look at uh, the R8 e-tron. And e-tron, by the way, is... Uh, the nomenclature we will use which will apply to all Audi models uh, driven so by... So you would not call the A2 the A2, you would call it the e-tron e something? It will be the A2 e-tron. Uh -huh. So this will be the R8 e-tron, and uh, this car is slated to go into production, and uh, we will in fact be bringing this to the U.S. Uh, within uh, the next year or so. Really? That soon? Any, can you tell us a bit more about it? Pricing, for example. Well, we have to wait and see. It's obviously <laughs> a high-end automobile and a lot of expensive technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be pricey. It'll be way north of $200,000. Wow. But, uh, that but it's going to be a technical tour de force, right? I think one has to begin to, to, to see that electric vehicles will really uh, develop from, from two opposing poles. One will be smaller, lighter, more... Your, uh, commuting transportation oriented car. The other way the real technology is going to be developing will be in the high end. And you package it in a very emotional design which has intangible value because it's expensive technology. And uh, it will take many years, but eventually I think these two will converge. And that might be about the time when we'll reach the tipping point where you'll see uh, electrically powered cars begin to take up a sizable chunk of total vehicle sales. And you know, with all the, the media attention and excitement that goes around electrically powered vehicles, a lot of people may be thinking that they're around the corner and they're going to be mainstream. It's many, many years into the future. Well, let's go back and talk about performance of this car then. I can imagine it's only going to have blisteringly fast acceleration being electric. Well, that of course is one of the great uh, things about electrical power is you have all of that torque and uh, as you say the acceleration is uh, very very vivid and uh, one of the good reasons to package it in a, in a sports car body because that's the kind of performance that you get mm -hmm. and a very exciting indeed. Good, let's uh, continue to walk through. Is there anything else that you really well, want to highlight? I had referenced earlier uh, the DTRS. Oh, you right. see the example here on the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the Roadster version uh, in the US uh, will offer of course the coupe which you can see uh, next door. Now we had envisaged for uh, the TTRS um, to do a life cycle volume of around 500 cars. Um, this car quite famously uh, we introduced to the market in response to really overwhelming online appeals by, by enthusiasts. And uh, we are three weeks into the launch of the car and we've already taken 130 orders. So perhaps that 500 order limit might have been a little bit too conservative. Can you get the factory so here to, to make you some more? I think uh, we will uh, have to do some discussing with uh, the guys in, uh, in Ingolstadt. But uh, I'm pretty optimistic that we should get an opportunity for more. You know, we spoke about uh, the role of the S models right. and the introduction then of uh, the S8, the S7 and the S6 to really add some uh, punch in the, uh, the mid-weight performance area. But of course, Audi is also about luxury and uh, our luxury flagship is here in the AAW12 using uh, our 12-cylinder technology and uh, of course this is the ultimate expression of craftsmanship. The interiors that you can see on this car, um, this is the kind of thing that buyers spec. Uh, real luxury, uh, individually crafted interiors. Customers can specify uh, leather and wood, uh, carpets, the ceiling finish. And they can choose that all, all to their own to their liking. Own individual liking, and uh, the cars are custom made uh, and hand, hand, hand assembled uh, for them. And this is will be available in the U.S. market. This has when? just been introduced to the U.S. So uh, it starts with uh, a base uh, MSRP of $138,000. But as they say, when it comes to individualization and customization, the sky's the limit. <laughs> so you can spend as much money as you want on that. Whatever well, almost, you want, yeah, we can do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything else, Johan, or are we pretty well, much covered? I think uh, that covered we've it? covered uh, the main elements of, uh, of uh, what we have on the show today. 
but uh, as you can see, very, very busy stand. It is, and, it's jam-packed here. Uh, really, these cars are going to play a very important role now as uh, we leverage up the great momentum of the brand and try to also uh, capture the imagination of American consumers as we have done uh, already in Europe and in other parts of the world. Well, Johan, this has been fantastic. You're a natural at doing this. Here, I put a microphone in your hand, and you do my job for me. It's excellent. <laughs> well, it's, I'll stick to my day job. Though. Okay. <laughs> Johan Denison, thanks so much. I Thank really you. appreciate your time and taking us through the Audi display. Thank you, John. Okay, very good. Take care. Take care. Come on, folks. We're going to go take a look at more of the show here. You just got a big ad from Audi, but we have to thank them again as our sponsor for bringing you this live webcast. You can check it all out at AudiUSA.com. But come on, now let's go look at some more of what's going on at the show. You know, I know we're serious, too. Yeah, Audi sponsored this, and we took it through. But, you know, a lot of corporate executives, you put a microphone in their hand, and they just sort of choke up. Or even if you don't put it in their hand, they just sort of choke up. Denison did a pretty good job there. Hey. How you doing? Okay, we're, we're going live right now. We're webcasting. So tell us who you are and what you're doing at the shop. Uh, Steve Rogers, Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association of Canada, and here to uh, see all of the vehicles and see the opportunities. And I'll be speaking to them later on or, or participating in a panel discussion later on, uh, or moderating it, I should say, in, in Toronto. But, you know, okay, why are Canadian parts manufacturers interested in this shop? This was more, actually, BMW invited us to be here. They introduced us to their board. They told us about their new products, their localization. So I'm really here as a result of a BMW invitation. Okay, BMW got a plug on the show, too, then, there. But, Steve, good seeing you, man. We're, yeah, we're moving on you. here. Okay, take Look care. Look forward to seeing you, though, in, the, uh, in October. That'll be great. Uh, I'll, I'll be there then. Thanks. Okay, we want to make sure that Norm doesn't fall down the steps here with the camera. Careful. It's steep. And now we're meeting with Yost Capito, Yost John McElroy. Good seeing you. Good to see you. So we got to tell everybody that Yost is in charge of what? All performance at Ford, right? Yes, all performance vehicles and uh, the motorsport business development to see how we get the global vehicles into motorsport as well. So what's the big news for Ford at the, the Frankfurt show? Well, I've got great good news. First of all, we show the production ready Focus ST. In, Good. A, in a very bright yellow color, a unique color for the Focus ST. Uh -huh. And also we show the Fiesta ST Cons. Now, how's the reaction to that? Could that be the little brother of the Focus ST, but I really like? So I think that's great news. Well, I think we can just tell the audience, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. I think the okay. reaction is going to be fantastic here at the show, don't you think? Yeah, I, so, we just need a confirmation and then we are ready to go. So when I go around the show here, I see so many electrics, so many hybrids and the like. People are still interested in performance. And I think when you go around the show, you see that, isn't it? It's, in the past, it was it was a time there were all performance, then it swapped over all electric. But now I think, I think it's very balanced. You can have everything again. You have electric vehicles, you have hybrid, and you have also performance vehicles. So I think for everything is socially acceptable and it's acknowledged that people still want performance. Performance. And what also see the performance is also going with uh, reduced fuel consumption, very efficient. So I think that is all good. And the influence there from, from the electric vehicles into performance vehicles is also there. And I think it's quite good. Now, in Europe, of course, it's not just about fuel economy. It's about CO2 reduction. How do your performance cars uh, perform in that regard? Yeah, very good. So we reduced from the, for, from the uh, model that we had before us, from the ST to now, more than 25% on CO2 reduction. And CO2 reduction is equal to fuel economy. So if we work on that, it benefits the CO2, the fuel economy in Europe and in the US. As these vehicles that we do the STs, they are absolutely identical on the technical features from around the world. So Europe, US, and there was a concern that from the US that the enthusiasts said, hey, you had these great STs in Europe, we never get into the US. And uh, they were scared. If we get them to the US, they get all, you know, sweet and washed up. So I can guarantee it's not. They are exactly same spec, and we didn't do any compromise for any market. It's how the cars we did the cars in the past, how we thought as a performance team they should be, 
and they are still the same. They are as we think they should be. We don't do any compromise to any specific market, and I think that's what the enthusiasts want. I, I totally agree, but talk about tires then, because oft times we see European cars, which have normal radials, get equipped with all-season radials yeah. in the U.S. market, yeah. and then they just don't handle as yeah. well. What are you going to do with the ST? We're going to do exactly the same tires around the world, and this is summer and sports tires. And uh, I think when we look, when you have the, the Mustang GT500, that's also on really good sports tires, and people get used that in the winter time, uh, they put the winter tires on. Mm -hmm. I think that's the right thing to do. It saves you your summer tires, really, for when you have the fun on dry roads, and you have a proper car in the winter as well as the winter tires are really great. It, and it I is would the recommend, right. And you yeah. can put, and after market, you can put then all season tires on if you want, but I really wouldn't recommend that because you lose quite a lot of the fun that these cars uh, offer. Look, as an enthusiast, you're saying all the right things. I love hearing what you're having to say here. And, and you're right, you know, we should put snow tires on in the winter time and then yeah. can really enjoy the performance yeah. tires when the weather yeah, is good. And that saves you your good wheels. You could have different wheels, you know, so you have your nice wheels for the summertime. You save your tires for that, and I think that's an absolutely right thing to do. And I'm sure the per enthusiasts, they get that. Uh -huh. They're used to that. You know, if you buy the other performance vehicles, they, they already handle that. And uh, this goes down to smaller cars as well. If you want to handle them like like really good performance vehicles, you have to have the right tires for coming with that. And I'm sure that will be accepted. Absolutely. Now, uh, you start with the Focus ST. Now you're showing the Fiesta ST. Are you thinking about extending the performance line? Yeah, sure. You know, it's not we deliver those two cars and then it's done. So. We, we know what we're doing. We have an agreed performance vehicle strategy within Ford. We developed the performance vehicle DNA. So we know all the performance levels. We know what to do, how they should be. So whenever we get an approved program, we are ready to go with whatever performance level it is. How far up and down the line could that extend? I mean, Mondeo ST would seem to be a natural, one would think. Uh, you know, that depends on, on, on the markets and where to go. I think it's a natural list for BNC cars as they are globally and you can do that. Uh -huh. And then we also have uh, like regional vehicles, especially in the U.S. So the Mustang GT500 will not go away because it's not a global vehicle. It will be an SVT vehicle. Uh -huh. And the SVT Raptor will, will be in the future an SVT Raptor. They are successful and they are for the region, and they are right. So it also could be performance vehicles for other regions. But where we have global vehicles, these will be global performance vehicles if we do performance vehicles of those. Mm -hmm. And if you stick with c size vehicles, how about something like the C-Max? Would you ever think of doing an ST version of that? I'm, I'm not keen to distribute it to everything. The cars have to be credible performance vehicles. And in the moment, we've got enough vehicles that scream to be performance vehicles. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to put performance in everything. We look also what the customer wants. And we have to do where, where we get also business cases. So when you have the Focus ST, Fiesta ST, the volume is up. And those cars, when you look at them as a base vehicle, they scream, everybody say, we, why not performance vehicles? And I think we do those first and then keep the ST brand true. And that every car that has an ST brand has what every customer expects with an ST brand when you have seen the Focus ST and the Fiesta ST then. So that will be, there will not be a ST badge on something that it's not a true credible ST. Mm -hmm. You would think that Ford would want to combine or, or commonize the performance name. I mean, you have ST, you've had RS in the past, you yeah. have SVT. Yeah. One would think that you would want one yeah. name for it all. Uh, I think we can't have one name for it all. What we have, we have two groups. We have the U.S. group, it's SVT. The European group is Team RS. Internally, this is the global performance vehicle team. So it is one team, but we have the reputation of SVT and of Team RS, so we leave that. It's still the teams, and they do also the regional cars. But on the global cars, we work together. And we have the ST as a global first-level performance brand, and then the RS as a global secondary-level performance brand. So in the first level is also like the SHO, is on the level with the ST in the DNA. And we have the level up with the RS, and there is the SVT Vegas as well, the US ones like the GT500 or the Raptor. So I think we've got for every enthusiast, we've got the right product that they will really love. It goes from the Fiesta up to the Raptor, and I think that is that is a nice thing and makes my job so exciting. <laughs> You can tell it's exciting, man. You're you're really into this stuff. I, I yeah, think that's I, am. I, I I love what we do and what I'm doing, and I've got the freedom to do the cars right. Well, Jos Capital, so great talking with you. I really appreciate you nice taking to the talk time. To you. Yeah, it was yeah. excellent, man. Yeah, it was excellent talk to you. Thank Th you very thanks much. Thanks so much. And have a good show. Oh, we're doing that. We're doing as much. Thank you. Enjoy. Take care now.
Okay, we're going to take another break to thank our sponsor, Audi. Check it all out at AudiUSA.com. So let's keep moving, folks. You never know who you're going to run into at the show. Oh, here's somebody we got to talk to. This is this is Craig Wiggins, folks, from Continental, the big German supplier. Hey, so what, tell us your exact title. Uh, I'm Senior Vice President for Powertrain in North America, John. And you guys have got a big announcement at this show, too. Turbocharger, right? We do have turbocharger. Here, you hold the exactly. microphone. Cause, uh, and let's let's walk. Let's you know instead of just hanging out here, okay. it looks like it's going to rain any second now, which that's is something right. you always got to count on at the Frankfurt show. Absolutely, shop. but the excitement's inside anyway, so that's where we'll head. But let's start talking turbochargers because okay. there's really what maybe three turbo manufacturers, big turbo manufacturers in the world right now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Borg Warner is a big one. Uh, there's, uh, is it Ishikawa or Mitsubishi Honeywell. in, in Japan? Mm -hmm. uh, who am I blanking out on? Honeywell. On the other? Honeywell, of mm -hmm. course. You know, of course. which is Garrett Turbos. Mm -hmm. Why is Continental jumping into the game now? Well, in Continental, of course, one of the mega trends we're following is clean power. And you can see it in our new emissions levels that we have in the U.S. with the 54.5 miles per gallon bogey that's out there. Everyone has to come up with more efficient ways of transportation. So downsize the engine and turbocharge it, right? One way to do it is absolutely downsize the engine, not only a number of cylinders, but also in displacement. I mean, between 2010 and 2017, we'll see the number of engines smaller than two liters double in the U.S. Wow! Which is really a significant change. And it's all because of direct injection coupled with turbocharging, you reduce the engine size, which gives you lower friction, more efficiency, and then you boost the power back up through direct injection and turbocharging. Okay, but why is Conti getting into the business? I mean, there's some serious competition, some serious well competition established. Why are you guys jumping mm -hmm. in? Well, we're starting basically on the gasoline side because the growth is really in gasoline. And the OEMs have told us there's enough room for uh, other players to produce turbochargers. So, in other words, they just don't think there's enough manufacturing volume for turbos. They want more players in the game? Not with the growth that we see in gasoline. With diesel, it's already 100% penetration of turbos. So, right. that'll just be organic growth that we see in the world. But hey, for well, gasoline... Can we come up here? Because I want to ask you about a car. We'll continue to talk about Conti. But here, Volkswagen is showing this, this little car, the Up. The Up, yes. It's uh, under 10,000 euro, which would be... Uh, you know, what, about $14,000? 14, $14, what do you roughly. think? I mean, what, what's your take on it? Well, one of the trends that we're following is, of course, affordable cars. We have safety, we have information management, powertrain, and, of course, affordability. And this plays right into the European space for affordable cars. So the thing is, how do you take all of those systems that we're developing today to create the efficiency that an affordable car will play into? And I think this is a perfect example of what's happening in Europe. There's not a lot of people looking at this car right now, but later, earlier today, this place was jam-packed with uh, folks looking at this thing. Yeah, it's very exciting. I mean, and for us as well, Volkswagen is uh, Continental's largest customer. Oh, is that right? Globally. Well, it makes and sense. The biggest German company with one of the biggest German suppliers. That's right. Well, we're number three supplier in the world for is the right? one perspective. Yes. Wow. So, so what? Yeah. The others would be Denso and Bosch? Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So powertrain, what else? What else are you guys working on? Well, of course, besides the uh, the obvious turbocharging. In fact, we just launched our turbo this year and this month or this week, excuse me, in series production. So uh -huh. we just actually launched. Where are you making that turbo? We're going to be making it in Germany. Uh huh. And uh, tell us a bit about it. You know, years ago, there, everybody was so hot to trot on uh, ceramic impeller blades. Uh, what do you guys making yours out of? We're milling it. Okay. We're milling Has anyone impeller. ever gone ceramic? Uh, there's been some areas where it's very high temperature. It's from a cost effectiveness scale. It's not quite as uh, good as milling. We find milling very efficient. Also, we have very lightweight impellers, so it speeds very quickly, which is very important, of course, to get your quick torque. Uh -huh. Because with these small engines, you need to have uh, the replacement torque for a low-end launch, and that you need at a very high speed as well. Quick response. Okay. Talk um, turbos. What else do you see going on? Well, other than that, of course, there's the uh, e-mobility. That's, of course, uh, something in powertrain that continues to be very, very important. Electric cars. Electric you mean? cars. Yeah. So we just uh, launched this... Uh, for this year, a drive line with another OEM in, in Europe. That will be a full electric drive line. Uh, and this is the you one. You can't that announce who that uh, European OEM is yet. Actually, it uh, it was just released today, so it's Renault. 
Oh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. So it'll be Renault. You know, Renault, of course, being tied up with Nissan as well, they're going a whole hog when it comes to electrics. They're very aggressive, and it's a very impressive concept, and they will have, uh, you know, they're estimating 60,000, 70,000 units a year. That's pretty aggressive. These two. Very aggressive. Can you say which vehicles they're on? It will be on the Kangoo. Which is a little sort of a cargo small van. Cargo van, and the other one, the Fluence uh, electric vehicle. And the Fluence is what? Uh, that's a kind of sexy car thing? Small car, yes. Yeah. So it's very exciting for them and, and for us. We appreciate being part of that uh, part of that launch. And speaking of electrics, I believe we're looking right now at this little one-seater that Volkswagen is debuting at the show, the Nils. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Do you think one-seaters will ever catch on in the market? I think a one-seater, I mean, it's very utilitarian, so you have to have a niche market that will have the one-seater uh Transportation. You saw an Opel booth today had uh, a two-seater implementation that was also a similar configuration in electric vehicle. So I think everyone is looking for that uh, correct niche on how you do individualized transportation. You know, I, I love this car, man. I would love to drive this thing, but I just don't see it making it in the U.S. market because side impact, there's just no protection there. Right. Now, I understand this is a concept vehicle. Nonetheless, uh, as much as I would love to drive this thing, I just don't think that NHTSA would let it in the market. Well, I think they do have to do some work probably on site impact protection and maybe roll over before. But, of course, Volkswagen is, is extremely uh, strong when it comes to safety concepts. So I'm sure they've thought through all this and how to expand it to the other markets. Okay, so electric, turbo, anything else that we should be talking about? Well, certainly, certainly trends in the U.S. are um, increasing number of speeds in the step automatic mm -hmm. and double clutch transmissions. Mm -hmm. So double clutch transmissions we see increasing significantly in the U.S. as well. Uh, gives you that efficiency of a manual without the, uh, say, the inherent losses of the automatic. But there's and been some consumer kickback too, right? You know, because people are used to the way that an automatic with a torque converter launches. Is it just a learning curve, or are there other things that you can do to tune these DCTs to to feel more like a, a torque converter kind of automatic? Well, I think if you tune it to where uh, the American consumer is interested in feeling like an automatic, I think there is some success there. The Ford Power Shift, I think, feels extremely good when you're in a uh, in an area where you drive it it really feels like an automatic mm -hmm. and that power shift is a double clutch six speed um, that they've implemented and they more or less sell it as an automatic so they don't really tell the consumer that it's a mechanical transmission with dual clutches okay six speed seven speed eight speed even nine speed even we're nine gonna speeds. see how many gears are we going to end up with here well there's uh, as you know every year someone comes out with a new theory about how many speeds are the maximum <laughs> right. a few years ago it was six or seven uh, lately I've heard ten and so ten? really yes yeah, so it, it uh, but that's but I would be a say nine getting challenge, very close right you know how do you get so many gears packed in and still get it under the heart uh, I mean a nine speed the in the in a front-wheel drive application is, is a challenge in, in itself. But up to 10 so far is what you're saying, huh? Some people say that may be the end of the efficiency curve, but it's hard to tell because uh, a few years ago, 9-speed would have been a little bit extreme for a front-wheel drive small car, but that's mm -hmm. what we'll be seeing there as well. So that, um, some of the other activities, of course, besides e-mobility, downsizing, turbocharging, uh, is all the sensing around an engine. So how do you really optimize efficiency? Um, as we talked, this fuel quality sensor, which is something that uh, really is important as you try to optimize every last drop of power out of the fuel, um, you need to know what exact kind of fuel is it. So what kind of octane it has, cetane, does it have sulfur, does it have water, and then you can adjust your engine parameters really to optimize, and that's another uh, innovation that uh, Continental has been working on. So we see that much variation in fuel that you you've do. got to monitor it for you do. Usually, how clean or dirty it is? Uh, yes, of course, between countries, or between continents, you see major diversity. Well, that I knew, but, but even, even within, within... Even within, like, the European Union, or certainly in the U.S., you find different qualities, and, and normally when you... When you do some type of calibration of an engine, you, you take kind of that lowest standard. Lowest and common denominator, that. and now these sensors will allow you to optimize. To really for optimize uh, tables within, within that fuel and quality. And is that for performance, fuel economy, emissions, or all the above? Well, it can lead to all the above. I mean, focus is really on optimizing for emissions, um, but that inherently can give you fuel economy improvements as well. Cool. Craig, man, thanks so much. Really, really thanks, interesting, uh, you know, update on everything going on in powertrain. Well, I certainly appreciate time today, John. Real good. Thanks Thank again. Have a great time with the show. I will. Thanks.
Hey, we'll see who else we get here, but again, time to thank our sponsor, Audi. Check it all out at AudiUSA.com. They've got some pretty cool stuff on their website, even more than what we were able to show you in their own pavilion. Okay, let's see where we go from here. Let's, let's get out and see what's going on. Yeah, take a look at this. I mean, you know, Hey, how you, how you doing? Good Very seeing you, good. Klaus. Really good. Hey, wait, come here a minute. We're we're webcasting live right now, so we're live. Are you yeah, yeah, me? yeah. This is Klaus Busi, one of the designers at Chrysler Corporation. What what are you looking at at the show? Oh, it's always good to get an idea what the Europeans are up to. You know, coming from there, and they have some fantastic stuff like every time. So you're out here to take notes and uh, see yeah, what they're yeah. up to. Yeah, you need to know where the competi competition stands now, especially with the Chrysler Lancia linkage, the Fiat Dodge linkage. So there is a lot of interesting stuff for us to see, look at. Any of your stuff at the show here? Yeah, of course. I mean, we have the Grand Cherokee SRT8, which is which is you know bring the American power to good old uh, Germany here. Uh, the Maserati is a beautiful uh, automobile to look at. So there's some stuff for our stands. Cool. Glad, glad we ran into you, Klaus. Same take here. care, man. Take care. Yeah. So, you know, anybody who's been to an auto show before knows that you go into a big exhibit, and I know I was saying this at the top of the show, you know, if you're familiar with, let's say, in the U.S., the Detroit Auto Show or the L.A. Show, the New York or the, or the Chicago Show, this show is probably bigger than all of them combined. Now, part of the reason is they have all kinds of suppliers here. You know, that's why we ran into Craig Wiggins from Continental, but all kinds of suppliers, all kinds of small manufacturers who are here, really cool stuff going on. You can buy car models here. You can go shopping to your heart's content. In fact, a lot of people in Germany plan to come on vacation to Frankfurt and take in the show. We're at the media days, obviously, and in another couple of days, they'll open this up to the public. But kind of wild how people will actually plan their vacation around coming to the show. And because it is so big, you can spend days here. If you really want to check out everything, you can walk for miles just trying to check out everything that's going on. Let's, come on, here we go. Tom, how are you doing? Really good. good. Hey, good. we're going live here. So everybody, this is Tom Kovaleski from BMW. You're now live. Yeah, this is you're, great. You're now live. Oh, I'm walking in live. Hi, everyone. How are you? Do you have great somebody? to be here with you in Frankfurt. Who, who can we talk to here? Tony Douglas. Tony. Hi, John. Here, Tony Douglas. Up? Tony, hold the microphone. Oh, thank it makes you. my job easier. Okay. And uh, no, <laughs> I've got a microphone on. Okay. So th this is just for you talking. But you what? You run all marketing for BMW, right? No, I do the marketing for Mobility Services. Oh, it's Mobility. Business, okay. Mobility and explain for our audience what Mobility okay, Services. Okay. Well, we launched the the, the new subbrand BMW i, which uh -huh. is the, the E3 yeah. and the E8, and together with these cars, uh, we're you also, say E, we say I. Oh, so I say yeah. BMW yeah. i. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i8 and i8 yeah, yeah. Um, but we launched this uh, sub brand together with mobility services so uh -huh. we're building up a, a portfolio of mobility services so actually our first investment was in my city way in in uh, new york uh -huh. uh, and that involves what that involves uh, basically a city guide uh, which allows people to orientate uh, within uh, large cities like new york washington and boston but we're also rolling out across europe it, did it happen in New York first and then roll out yeah. elsewhere? Yeah, it's, uh, we set up a, an BMWI Ventures, an venture capital company, and that was the first inventor, uh, investment we made. Actually, they were the winner of the Big Apps competition by, from oh. Mayor Bloomberg in New York. Right. Uh, that was our first investment. We made our second one in, uh, with Park at My House, which is a UK-based innovation, which I think is great, coming from the UK. Uh, but they basically offer it for like an eBay for parking, so you can you can put your parking spot in downtown onto this marketplace, and you can make money by renting it out to people who are looking for a parking spot. Whoa, 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 whoa! Explain that again. Yeah. How does that work? Well, you think how you know, eBay works? Mm -hmm. You got something and you want to sell it. Right. Well, just think of the same for parking. I've got a parking space outside my house, and when I drive to work, it sits there empty. Make all money day off it. Yeah, make money off oh, it. Oh, that's brilliant. Not just that, but when you think about it, a third of the traffic that's running around the centers of the cities today is looking for a parking spot. Anything you can do to enhance parking reduces the amount of traffic in the city center. Oh, this has got to be something that you would take worldwide then. Well, we're looking to do that. <laughs> Everybody who lives in a city who's got a parking spot, pay attention to this because this is amazing. So you've, uh, what, pioneered this, piloted this in the no, UK? No, this is, this is a UK, uh, if you like, startup, but it's been on the market for three or four years. And we saw this through the eyes of BMWi, looking at we want to enhance mobility in the urban environment. And one of the key problems to solve is parking. Mm -hmm. And these guys have got a really innovative solution, so we said we want to be part of this action. How's it working? It's working very well. We've already got 120,000 active uh, customers in the UK alone, 
and we're looking to roll that out across Europe and also looking... What a great yes. idea. What a great idea for you guys to team up with them to do this, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another great thing I've got to tell you about oh, yeah, yeah, is our car sharing activity. So we went live in Munich uh, with Drive Now, which is our joint venture between BMW, I, Mini, and the rental company Sixth. Basically, you can park, you can pick up a car anywhere in the street, drive it anywhere, leave it, pick up another car, drive, leave it. So we're not talking about point-to-point -point car sharing. We're talking about pick up the car where I want to pick it up, drive to where I want to go, leave that car, go do my shopping, get out of the other side of the town, pick up another car, and drive home. How do you manage that? That's got to be, I would think, a logistical nightmare to manage that. That's our secret. <laughs> Are you no, serious? No, there's a combination. There's a combination of some good BMW technology and some good back-end IT from our partners in Sixth. That is uh, fascinating. So, and you said you were doing that where, Munich? Munich, yeah. And uh, how's that going? What's that's the feedback going, so far? It's going very well. We've got more than 5,000 active users of that service already. Oh, my god. we're rolling it out in Berlin end of this month, and we're looking at other cities as well. So if I lived in Munich or Berlin, what would it cost me to sign up for the service? 29 euros sign-up fee, and then 29 cents per minute as you're driving. 29 euros, what's that, lifetime fee? No, or? 29, just one, one, one sign up Really? Fee. And then 29 cents a minute for driving. Oh, I can see where all kinds of people would want to be part of that then. Yeah. It's kind of like Zipcar, but you get to choose your car and plan ahead to have everything, Well, right? Zipcar with minis and BMWs. <laughs> and you can drive and leave the car where you want within reason, i.e. Uh -huh. legal parking spaces. So, and you've arranged to have these specific so spots where to drop fee, them off. So we've got a flat fee with the city to cover the parking. And basically it's like a, a flat rate for parking, if you like. So the, the customer doesn't have to care about parking. I keep on saying, actually, that sometimes they're getting a better service than some of our um, established customers. If you buy a new BMW, you don't get parking thrown in. Yeah. With Drive now, you get parking thrown in. Very interesting. So what else? What else are you all working on? That's just at? the start. That's so, <laughs> Flexible usage, which is basically our um, internal name for things like car sharing and drive now. Things like parking. Parking is a key asset. So if, when you're looking at e-mobility in the near future, um, you can't charge a car without parking. So you need to have parking sorted out really before you start talking about charging your car, unless of course you're just charging at the point of work or in the domestic environment. That's one thing. Uh, smart navigation, so we made the announcement about real-time traffic information, that's the first step. But uh, smart navigation 2.0, as we like to call it, is tying up between public transportation, car transportation, bicycles, pedestrian. That's smart navigation. You know, automakers have talked for years about how they're not really in the automotive business, they're in the transportation yep. business. BMW seems to really be walking the talk now. I think we're starting to say we're in the mobility business. Yeah, so yes, the car is an important part of that mobility business, but um, I think if your customer's sitting there for two hours in a traffic jam, he's probably going to get quite frustrated. So why not get him out of his car and put him in an, a train, if the train's going to get him there quicker, you know, for that part of the journey. So you're looking at all mobility? Yeah. What's the vision here? Where, where does it all go? <laughs> well, I think the, the, real, the, real, the real challenge is tying up all the different nodes of transportation. It's no secret the transportation landscape is highly fragmented. Yeah? So the bus guys rarely talk to the train guys, and the train guys don't really talk to plane guys, and us car guys certainly don't talk to plane guys, although we're starting to. So it's, it's, it's tying up all these different modes of transportation to make seamless mobility. So we say, okay, we've got mobility in the car, sorted. But let's look at other things around the car. The car is a central hub to mobility, but uh, let's try and tie, tie all these things together to enhance really the mobility experience for our cons consumers. And this is going to grow as a sub-brand within BMW? So we have, um, it's actually set up within a, within a project within BMW. We are using the BMW i sub-brand as a as a, as, a, as, a, as a launch pad, if you like, for a lot of these ideas, because it's, it's a great playing field. We've got a new brand, we've got new electromobility, and these guys are looking to go a different way. So I keep on saying, well, everyone knows what BMW M stands for. I call it autobahn mobility or motorway mobility. Urban mobility is slightly different. So BMW I is going to stand for urban mobility. So how do we enhance urban mobility? And the things I just mentioned, parking, car sharing, and so on, are just some of the enablers that help us enhance urban mobility. And BMW will take this concept globally then, will it? Well, BMW is a global company, so yeah, yeah. when the market's there, we will, <laughs> we will definitely look beyond Europe. That's great. Anything else, or have we covered it all? I think we've covered it all. So okay, I would, good, I good, say, good. I would say stay tuned, there'll be more. 
when you think we didn't have anything 12 months ago and we've now got four or five good things on the go, check back in six months and I can guarantee we'll have another two or three exciting things to share with you. Fantastic. We'll definitely check back. I want to see where this is going. Okay. This is a new aspect to the automotive industry. Thank you, John. Very good. Thanks for your time. Okay. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Let me walk over and show them the track. Oh, the yeah. Outside. Come on. You know, we had showed you the outside of the Audi building, and I talked about a test track. Let's show you a little bit of what's going on in that thing. And, man, it looks like the skies could open up any minute here. It looks like it could really start pouring down rain any second. But so far it's held off. It was raining earlier this afternoon, so I'm glad that we can be outside right now and not have to worry about the rain. But this is pretty wild what uh, Audi's done of building this test track. And I'm sure if they uh, let the public drive cars here, this place is going to be jam-packed during public days. Norm, come on up under here. We'll show the, everybody what this is all about. And of course, nothing's running now that we want to show it. But you can see people staging into cars right now, and there's a ramp that runs around inside this building. And uh, I hear a car taking off, so they'll probably be coming down this ramp any minute. Come on down here and show them how the ramp moves up here. And you know, automakers have done this sort of thing at other auto shows where you can drive around a bit, but usually it's pretty hokey, you know? You'd... This thing looks like they're, they're moving a whole lot faster than I would have ever expected. So kind of wild, just to get an idea of what goes on at auto shows. And they've, oh, the e-tron. So they've got the electric vehicles running around on this track as well. That's pretty wild. Well, come on, let's walk on and see what else that we can find here. Follow me. We're going to go, let's go inside the Mercedes building. And uh, we'll probably wrap up uh, this live webcast with uh, one of the wildest vehicles that is at the show. And like I said, we can't show you everything. It's just too big. I mean, we'd literally have to walk at least a half a mile away just to get to some of the other uh, displays. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like we're almost walking around too much outside. But that's what you got to do if you really want to get easily from one building to the next. And as I said before, there's something like nine, nine or ten different halls here that are uh, exhibiting what's going on. And uh, we'll have to walk through the smart display to get to Mercedes. I guess they did it that way deliberately because I don't think anyone's going to look at the smart cars otherwise. But again, giant building that Mercedes has unto itself, which as I mentioned before is what all the German automakers are able to do, have their own buildings. Still got a bit of a hike, come on. The smart display. This is funny, back in the days of Daimler Chrysler, this is where all the Chrysler Dodge and Jeep displays were. Now they've got smart inside this part of the building. Gotta put something in here. Hold with us, folks. We're getting there. We gotta get up the staircase, down a long hallway, and then we'll be able to show you what I think is a pretty cool concept car that Mercedes unveiled this morning. It's what they call the F125. It's really a concept car for the S-Class. And they've sort of been signaling where they're going with the S-Class for a number of years right now. And uh, last time I was at the Frankfurt show, they had an S-Class concept with a four-cylinder, turbo four-cylinder engine in it. This one doesn't have that, and I don't want to give too much away until we get right up to the car itself. 
And, uh, you know, like I said, I apologize that it takes such a long walk just to get inside here. But this is a pretty cool building. Norm, show them the ceiling. I mean, just this place is wild. And again, you know, uh, it's pretty cool when you have your own building. You can build it out exactly the way that you want, unlike at most other auto shows where you've got to work with the floor space that the show organizers allocate to you. Here, Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen Group, Audi, they don't have to worry about that. They have got their own buildings, each of them, to do whatever they want with them. And it's pretty wild, even though the outsides of the buildings don't change, Every time you come to the show, the interiors of the building are completely different than what they were on the prior show. Okay, one thing you got to know, when you see concept cars, because we're about to look at this F-125, it's got gullwing doors. I don't know why all the car companies always do gullwing doors. Come on over this way, Norm. Watch your step. But they do gullwing doors because it makes a car look dramatic. But of course, they never put it into production or rarely put it into production just because it's way too much of a problem to try to build good doors like that that are really pretty good. So, okay, this is the F-125. It's a fuel cell car. What I find interesting, though, is automakers always use concept cars to signal where their future design is going. I find the front end of this very interesting because if it did not have that three-pointed star on the grill, it would be very difficult to say that this is a Mercedes. Usually when Mercedes does a grill, it does it in such a way that you instantly recognize it's a Mercedes. Now perhaps there's Cognoscenti out there or some of you people in the design community would say, well obviously that's a Mercedes. Guess what? To me, it's not. It's kind of weird looking in a way to see a front end on a car like this and knowing that this could be a hint of where the next S-Class is going. But anyways, at least we got you all a chance to take a look at that. And with that, well, come on down here, Norm, if we can uh, do it. They've got another concept car I want to show you all. You know, obviously, I'm not a big fan of the Smart, but they do have a concept version of it here that I think is indicative of what they could do with the styling of this. I don't know if you can elbow your, your way in. Hey, Clay, hold on a second. We're, uh, we're going live here on the web right now. We're talking with Clay Dean, who's the head of advanced design at General Motors. And uh, so have you guys shown the CL here at the show yet? We have shown the CL. Okay, and the reaction? It was it was pretty amazing. I, a lot of people um, were really enthused about the car. Uh, we've had some really good crowds around it this morning. Great comments like, the Germans would never do this. <laughs> so that's good. That is good. So what do you see here at the Frankfurt Show that you like? It's pretty impressive. Um, a great focus on mobility, uh, urban mobility, uh, a lot of small cars, city cars that are pretty impressive. I think, um, of course, the Cadillac CL is the antithesis of small city cars. Well, you need to, it provides you need to do contrast, it all, right? yeah. hot and cold, sweet and sour, you know? <laughs> and so uh, we're all focusing on large luxury with the CL, which I think is great. But I think it's, uh, you know, the great thing coming to Frankfurt, you've got the, the home brands here. They really put on a presentation. Um, the exhibits and the displays are spectacular. It's really impressive. We, we just showed the audience the F-125. Have you seen that car yet? I'm just walking up to see it right okay. now. So What I was telling them, what I found weird is if you took the three-pointed star off the grill, I don't think you'd recognize it as a Mercedes. And I thought that was kind of curious because usually when you see a Mercedes, you know, instantly, you don't even need the three-pointed star on it. I agree. I think um, it's, 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 it's adventuresome what they're doing over there. So... You have to have a lot of confidence to kind of jump that hard, that far out from the shore. So it'll be interesting to see what people think about it. Cool. Hey, Clay, glad I ran into you, man. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Okay. You take care. Okay, we'll do that. So anyway, let's wrap up on this, uh, this concept version of the Smart because, you know, we've seen the Smart design for so long. It's, it's just nice to see them at least do some amount of freshening to it. And, uh, you know, the next generation of smart cars will actually be off a platform shared with Renault. I don't know if this is indicative of where that design may go or not, but uh, I kind of like what it's, uh, what it's doing there because it looks a whole lot better than the old smart that we've been looking at.
And with that, folks, no, that's okay, Norm. You, you can put it on me because we're going to wrap up now. We're going to finalize this by thanking our sponsor, Audi. Like I said, check it out at AudiUSA.com. But we especially want to check in, you know, thank all you folks who have stayed with us through this live webcast. It's really cool. We, we love bringing this technology. We're the only ones doing this at the show. And uh, going to sign off now, but thanks for having tuned in.